Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Collins. I'm the executive director of Solar One, and I want to welcome you all, both in person and online, to tonight's installment of Clean Energy Connections. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Clean Energy Connections is a program Solar One developed in conjunction with the New York City Accelerator for a Clean and Renewable Economy at NYU Poly to advance New York's clean energy economy. Tonight marks our fifth um, in event in a series of events. Before we start, I do want to remind everybody that the next one will be on November 30th, and it's on electric vehicles. Can New York City have a fleet-based approach? So mark that on your calendars if you would. But let's talk about tonight. Uh, tonight we bring you biomimicry in the big city. Can nature inspire clean tech solutions? Inherent in the title, tonight's debate will ask the central question, can we use biomimicry? the concept of mimicking biological design and systems to create new products and processes to build both innovative and useful clean energy technologies. The topic is close to Solar One as we are believers that innovative and daring design can readily lead us to a new clean energy economy. We will soon turn our thoughts into actions with the construction of Solar Two, our planned energy positive building there will be a model of what the exceptional green design and construction can be in the urban built environment. So although we see the potential for biological design technology to have a fruitful relationship, we don't claim to have all the answers, and we hope our esteemed panel tonight will come to one by the end of the evening. As always, this is not a lecture. This is a discussion. So we encourage the audience participation and questions. For our in-person audience, please write down your questions to the panelists on the index cards provided, and the runners will get them from you. To our online audience, you can write your questions on the comments section right below the live stream, or tweet them to us at cleanecnyc with the tash, hashtag poundcleanenrgx. Um, before we begin, I do want to take a minute to thank um, Terrapin Bright Green, uh, our partner in this event, for all of their guidance and hard work in putting together tonight's program. Terrapin's been a really big supporter of Solar One and for Solar Two, both respect, with respect to our programs and our new building, and, and I'm delighted that they're here tonight, and, and I think you'll really enjoy the presentation. Um, I'd also like to thank our sponsors, NYSERDA, Con Edison, and Loeb and & Loeb for their continued support of this series, and Green Tech Media, Young Professionals in Energy, and the New York Association for Energy Economics for their continued partnership in this entire series. And now to introduce our opening speaker, we're very lucky to have with us all the way from Albany, uh, Miriam Pai from NYSERDA. At NYSERDA, Miriam is the Senior Project Manager of Manufacturing Technology Development and focuses on industrial productivity. She also manages New York NYSERDA's biomimicry program, which is one of the only such programs offered by an agency uh, a state agency in the country. So please uh, join me in welcoming Miriam. Thank you, Chris. As Chris said, um, I'm Miriam Pai from NYSERDA, and at NYSERDA I manage a grant program, and we fund energy efficiency research for the industrial sector. Um, but in a prior life, back in the 1980s, I got an MBA. And I, uh, I was a financial analyst at a couple of Fortune 500 companies, and ultimately I was the CFO for a small to medium-sized uh, music publisher. So in the 90s, I decided to change careers, and um, I went back to school for energy and environmental studies. But I went back with the goal of solving energy and environmental issues using a business perspective. Because too often, clean tech gets dismissed as being a luxury that we can't afford. Um, the argument soon turns to whether or not climate change is man-made. And I would contend that whether or not climate change is man-made is irrelevant to whether or not we want to invest in innovation in the clean tech sector. The clean tech sector allows us to diversify our energy portfolio. And certainly that's a basic in all MBA programs, to diversify your portfolio. Um, in the projects that I manage at NYSERDA, 
They always have to have something to do with energy efficiency, but they're never only about energy efficiency. They're always about making products better, faster, cheaper, and cleaner. And so we always see that these are always business decisions as to why people choose to invest in energy efficiency research. So clean tech requires innovation, and certainly that's what America was built on. And I think that's a key component to getting our economy back on track. Um, and I think that biomimicry is one approach to innovation. So what is biomimicry? Well, we've heard it's, it's mimicking nature, it's emulating nature's genius. Nature has had 3.8 billion years to figure things out. They didn't do it particularly efficiently. It's all by trial and error. But they have figured out what works and what doesn't work. For example, nature has no waste. What one plant or one system puts out as a waste, another system uses as a feedstock. Plants use CO2 as a feedstock. And NYSERDA has helped a small company in Ithaca called Novomer start a company that uses CO2 to offset petroleum. And they use 50%, instead of the petroleum, they use CO2 to make plastics. They're in Ithaca, and they're making it happen. Uh, many scientists and companies are looking at photosynthesis to help make better solar cells. And you'll hear more about that later this evening. Nature's genius is not always intuitive. If you look at a whale fin, the leading edge has tubercles on it, bumps. You wouldn't think that would be very efficient. You would think to be most efficient, you'd want that to be smooth. But they researched that because some scientists saw that and was puzzled. And they realized it is more efficient. And now a company called Whale Power is manufacturing wind turbine blades that have bumps on them and are 10% more efficient. Regen Energy, I don't know, is anyone checking out the, uh, the slides that were rotating earlier. Regen Energy sells wireless energy controllers that mimic swarm logic exhibited by bees. They save 5 to 10 percent of a facility's energy use. So bees have figured out how to keep their hive within a very tight temperature range. Termites have figured out how to keep their mounds within a very tight temperature range also. There is a commercial building in Zimbabwe that mimics termite mounds. And they have created a self-regulating um, ventilation system that keeps the building at comfortable temperatures without a fuel-based air conditioning system. They saved 10% of their construction costs, $3.5 million. And the rents they charge are lower because they have the energy savings. Interface Floor is another example. They have taken a biomimetic approach to their carpet products, and that approach has helped them make it through these difficult economic times. So we've seen many successes. Nature has done a lot of research already, and there's no intellectual property. So innovators can use it for free. <laughs> this sounds like a good deal. They can use it to make new clean tech products or to make old products cleaner and more efficient. So that gives us a head start on R&D. And that's what, at NYSERDA, um, we're always helping companies try to defray the risk of R&D. And we see biomimicry as a way to defray risk because it gives you a head start on figuring out how things work and how things work well. That's what we're in the business of doing at NYSERDA. We're currently funding a project with Terrapin Bright Green and uh, Biomimicry 3.8, trying to help New York State innovators be more aware of biomimicry and to make them more aware of the value it can bring to innovation. We're about a year into the project. We have a lot of demand for an interest in learning about biomimicry. And our goal is to use biomimicry to enhance New York State's clean tech economy, environment, and energy efficiency. So tonight we have a great panel. Our moderator is Rena Jana. Rena is a journalist who covers the world 
worlds of design, business, and culture, and how they influence each other. The former innovation department editor at Business Week, she has written for the New York Times, Wired, Fortune.com, Harvard Business Review Online, Architectural Record, Art Forum, and numerous other publications. She's currently a contributor, contributing editor at the CBS interactive site Smart Planet and a consulting editor at Frog, a global innovation firm. So, Rena. So um, thank you, Miriam, for that introduction. Um, you know, we're all here because biomimicry is a really compelling design and engineering strategy. Um, and we've heard some thrilling examples um, from her introduction. Uh, I'd like to introduce you quickly to our panelists. I know you have their biographies, but um, it's good to put the names with the faces in person. So to my left is Samuel Cochran who is the chief executive, co-founder, and co-design director at SMIT, which stands for Sustainably Minded Interactive Technologies. Nice to see you. Um, and to his left, we have Mark Dorfman. He's a consulting scientist at Biomimicry 3.8. To his left, we have Pat Sapinsley. She is an investment professional with Good Energies and also the president of Build Efficient. See, efficiently. efficiently, excuse me, sorry about that. Nice to see you. And to her left, we have Chris Garvin from Terrapin Bright Green, where he's a partner. Um, and thank you all for being with us. Um, again, as I said, they were, well, there was a, a great list of examples from Miriam's introduction. And she also brought up that point that biomimicry might actually, you know, provide examples or projects or prospects that might have less risk because of billions of years of R&D behind them. I think it'd be really interesting to talk about that, um, again, from the investor point of view and also from the startup point of view in terms of um, that side of the research and development. I mean, is it that simple? Maybe I'll throw that to Pat first. You know, when you see a, a project or a pitch um, that has a biomimetic design, um, does that seem like a safer bet? Well, biomimicry is a great starting point, right? I mean, it makes all the sense in the world that things will be more efficient if things are designed according to the laws of nature. But then, of course, you have man who is adopting these biomimetic <laughs> technologies and trying to bend them to his will. So it may or may not, the jury is still out. We, we need to see if these things are really going to uh, deliver on the promise. Uh, the promise is fascinating, but from an investment point of view, the most important thing for a venture capitalist to invest in is the business, not the technology. 20% uh, of what we're looking at is probably the technology. Obviously, it has to be a great technology for us to be interested in the first place. But the remainder, another 20%, is the team. Can the team make this thing fly? Is the team understanding of the issues that they're going to have to face? Do they have the capabilities? Do they have the track record? Can you work with them? Um, another 20% then is going to be the market. Uh, what does the market want? Does the market really want this product? Are there barriers to the market? Are we for, I'm an architect, so I look a lot at the construction market. The construction market is an entrenched industry. Is it going to try to keep this thing out? You know, so you have to do your market studies, you have to do your research on the team, you have to do your research on the technology. If all those things work, then there are all the externalities, right? There's the government regime that you're falling into. Um, there's whether this is going to require vast amounts of capital next year and the year after and the year after. There's the price of the deal. So all these things are just good venture capital, capital practice, and biomimicry is just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm wondering, Sam, maybe you could jump in as a yeah. startup co-founder. I would agree with that biomimicry is a great starting point, and it has the ability to offer shortcuts in some of your processes. So in the design process for us with Solar Ivy, seeing how Ivy interacts with our built environment and how it finds light and finds a foothold and 
can adapt to any building or any um, structure, whether it be a tree or somewhere else, to find more light um, became a great starting point for how photovoltaics could interact with our environment. Um, and then we address all of the other points, right. the making of that product, um, the distribution, the market, and what you might be going up against in terms of competition, um, the ability for it to not get dwarfed by other technology that might come around. Um, and we've addressed that in our design process as well. Um, you know, we're a sustainable company, so we look at how we can create a product that can have the lowest footprint while still addressing all of these other issues and, and be a product that can outlive the, uh, the building. I just wonder, though, if, if there is a danger, you know, to um, putting so much um, onto biomimicry as, um, you know, in, in, the, in the context of risk management. You know, I mean, is there a danger of oversimplifying the, the, um, the power of some of these designs that you see in nature or, or the sort of shortcutting? Um, some people could look at it that way. So I'm wondering if you could, you could talk a little bit about this, this, uh, this danger of oversimplification. Mark, it looks like good. Well, I actually was curious. Um, I wanted to follow up with, with, with Pat about companies because, you know, we've, we've uh, come across some, some really brilliant scientists who've come up with some really great products. They don't necessarily have the business acumen. So if, if that kind of individual or entity were to approach you for funding and they may not have the business side really, really, you know, all their ducks in a row, would you just, you know, sort of say, no, sorry, we can't help you? Or do you try to, uh, you know, if the technology really makes sense, do you try to help them really get it off the ground? I've, uh, it's always good to be a human being first, right? <laughs> a good human being first. So even if we think a company doesn't have great channels to market, or if there's some, if the price of the deal is wrong, or if there's something that makes us think we can't fund it, we always do the right thing. We, we try to coach them. We try to introduce them to people who can help them. You know, there, there are lots of entrepreneurs out there. It's a funny dance when you're doing venture capital because it's sort of like a little romance and then it all falls apart. So you want to be, you know, a good, decent human being. And if you know it's going to fall apart, you say to them, here are the reasons why this isn't going to work. Here's the homework you probably need to do. Come back to me next year or... Maybe you're too early. Maybe you should go for some seed funding. Here's some seed funding people we know. So you always reach out and do the right thing and do what you can to help them. So that's the way we do it. Because it's been rather frustrating to see some really great technologies that kind of, you know, fall apart because they may not have had the, the business side, you know, they've had the science done really well. And I think that's going to be an ongoing problem as more scientists begin to really um, see the potential of, of taking what they know from nature and applying it to the challenges in the world to actually not just translate it to a technology, but translate it to something that will make it into the market. So can I say oh, one more thing, Rena? Uh, there's a really interesting organization that addresses this issue. I don't know if people here know about the um, Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. It's part of Harvard University. And their mandate is to do cross-disciplinary research in biomimetic technologies, but then to nurture them and turn them into startups and launch them as commercial enterprises. So they have venture capitalists involved. They have, it's a fascinating place, and they're looking at really interesting technologies. I was lucky enough to tour their labs not long ago, and I saw fascinating, fascinating stuff, medical stuff, architectural stuff. It, it, I mean, I can tell you about a few of them if you want. Could you give us an example? I know you mentioned, uh, we had an exchange earlier where you mentioned Chuck Hoberman was working right. on a, a very interesting project. So, so Chuck is doing adaptive architecture there together with somebody called Joanna Eisenberg. Chuck is doing building facades that open and close. Chuck, are you in the audience? It's so bright out here. Okay. Um, <laughs> he's doing building facades that open and close, sort of like the pupil of an eye, um, in order to respond to the light of the sun. And Joanna is looking at the structure of deep sea sponges that build a structure out of sand. So they turn the sand into glass. They build this gorgeous, incredibly complex geometric skeleton, which is very, very strong, given that it's made out of glass. So she's trying to analyze the structure and what they do to the material, these sponges, in order to mimic those effects in architecture. 
So there are things like that. Then there's also medical research that's going on where uh, the way that proteins attach to pathogens in the blood to pull uh, toxins out of the blood has been studied and mimicked to such an extent that they've come up with a new machine that can do a blood test for sepsis in an hour using this mim mimetic device, where it used to take two or three days, and very often the patients would die by then. So, you know, this is useful, valuable stuff, and they're commercializing it. It's a very interesting place. Chris, I know you had some opinions, and we were, you know, just discussing before the panel or leading up to it um, regarding um, biologists and, and their track record with investors or just the whole sort of how, how these two worlds come together or not come together, just to um, follow up on, on this. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad Mark, Mark said it first so I don't feel bad. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I, think we, I think there's a common, in, within the biomimicry world, there's this frustration that there's these great ideas that kind of just keep kind of getting really close to market and then evaporate. I mean, literally, they, you can't find the, the inventor any longer. It sort of becomes very frustrating. So you get, this, you get this sense of like, oh, maybe this doesn't work. But I think it's just like Pat said. It's about that business side. There's this gap. And part of our effort with NYSERDA is actually one of, the, one of the components is to develop uh, a biomimicry innovation center in New York State that will actually help innovate on this topic and bring both the business acumen and the venture capital to the science. And so we can get these ideas to, you know, implementation in, in all kinds of ways. We, we've, there's, there are some people we've been working with in this program that have some really fascinating uh, work that could be applied in fuel cells and in uh, boiler systems and I mean just like one idea that could be applied throughout multiple industries to make things more efficient and yet there's a sort of it's still in the prototyping stage in the in the ac academia and not making that step to prototyping in the company and then find a way to make that cost effectively and then get it to market and and make that differentiation um, and I think one of the great things about biomimicry is once you do get to market is you have this great story and it's a really powerful story that people resonate with. Um, but you've got to get past all of the, all the things that every product that we purchase and consume and unfortunately throw away has to go through the same process. It's not like biomimicry is unique in this challenge of finding the right business group, finding the right funding, finding the right channels, et cetera. Now, I'm wondering, um, Sam, maybe you could, you could speak to this a little bit, but um, in terms of the cost um, effectiveness as a startup, co-founder and taking a biomimetic approach, um, you know, some people might look at it and say, well, there's a tremendous amount of um, capital required, um, a lot of research um, that has to go into this type of design and engineering. Um, but then there have been the other arguments that we've talked about in terms of, you know, the billions of years of R&D that is sort of leading up to this idea. So which, uh, from your own experience, I mean, what's, what, what's the myth and what's the reality in terms of um, bringing a product to market? Well, I would say that there, while biomimicry can offer these great ideas and great stories, it still requires quite a bit to take it from that, the inception of that idea all the way through to, commercial, to a commercialized product. And that requires knowledge around all the different manufacturing processes that you might need um, and ways of getting it to a place that the market will accept that for not only the story that it might provide through the biomimetic background, but also so it, that it's competitive with a, what, a, what else might be in the market in that, in that area. Um, from our experience, we've been fortunate in that we've been able to partner with a, a number of universities. Um, we've worked with Stevens Institute with uh, a software in which we can create genetic genetic algorithms and really go through every iteration of solar ivy that we can to find what would perform best in certain scenarios. Um, we did that also with another product we have called Tensile Solar. Um, so there's a lot of looking at the solution that might have come from uh, nature and, and how it could be applied in, in a business. And then a lot of quick trial and error just as nature has done over the years. To, to refine that and bring it to a place that it could work in, in the public domain. 
Um, so from our experience, it's reduced some costs. It still has a, a number of, of uh, costs associated with that work. Um, and from us using universities and other partners in our manufacturing world to share some of those costs have been what, how we've mitigated that. Yeah, it seems like an interesting strategy. And Mark, I know you want to. Yeah, I think it depends on the type of biomedic product. So okay. using two of the examples that, um, uh, that Miriam just gave, so interface floors, uh, they came up with a better carpet design. So they were still making carpets, but they changed the design um, inspired by the, by the forest floor um, that enabled them to still produce carpet, but produce carpet um, instead of you know whole uh, huge pieces of carpets, carpet tiles that really you know changed uh, uh, the overall cost of marketing the product. Um, so there wasn't that much research and development. Then on the other hand, you have Novomer that looked at the enzyme in green leaves. It's able to take this very stable compound, carbon dioxide, and be able to make it reactive so it can be used to make all of the complex uh, carbon-based compounds that we use, you know, vitamins, pigments, plastics, whatever. So the amount of research that has to go into something like that, really looking at the enzyme, what is the reaction center, how do you mimic it? So it's kind of, you know, two, two ends of the spectrum there. And I'm wondering, though, going back to this um, worry of, of oversimplification um, and also sort of the challenges that, that are involved with taking the biomimetic approach, um, could we address some of that? Um, we know that um, these are all very positive examples, but maybe there are examples of, of, that have fallen flat or that have fallen short, um, or maybe there's an overall approach that, that isn't working um, which we've discussed a little bit before, so. But you know, that's how nature exactly. works. Not everything <laughs> that in the 3.8 billion years of life on Earth that nature um, created is still around. Um, because nature, you know, is it going to work in the context of, of, of sustainability, of, of, of resource use, um, uh, you know, toxicology, that sort of thing. So you know, we're even mimicking nature in that way of, of, of trying new biomimetic products, exactly. uh, and they, you know, some work, some don't. And I would just add that we also are still trying to figure out how nature does all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we're just getting the point in our own advancement of our technologies to have the tools to understand nanotechnology and how, at the, at the nano level, how uh, seashells are actually constructed. So we can start mimicking them. Before that, it was like grind up a seashell and use that because you know and which isn't you know isn't so great so um we have to put a little perspective on the situation that we're just going to point we have the capacity to do it and but i would say that you know to date a lot of things that we a lot of biomedic uh, products we talk about are very um say first generation biomimicry where it's a lot like the whale power is really mimicking a form so it's biomorphic um, there's a lot of architecture through the 60s and 70s that's very biomorphic um, even Interface, which has been, you know, an amazing financial success, is, you know, sort of the first level, because it's still using a petroleum-based product to actually make the carpet. It's not using non-toxic materials at room temperature. They're endlessly recyclable and, you know, within the, you know, within the, this world. They're, they're being, it's a first phase. And so I think when we can get, you know, with this, a better understanding, to a more complex and integrated understanding where it's not just about form, but it's about process, material, and you can even into the ecosystem of materials, then we're really gonna find sort of this, um, this breakthrough where it makes complete sense. We can eliminate all toxins in our environment, in our clothing, in our furniture, in our homes. They won't, we won't need them because they'll all be natural materials because we figured out how to make everything we need in a, in a, in a healthy way. And one of the exciting things is that science is just progressing all the time. Our ability to, uh, you know, view nature at the nanoscale is improving all the time. Our dexterity with, with manipulating molecules at the nanoscale is also improving over time. So our ability to go from form to process to ecosystem where, you know, the whole life cycle of a product is more biomimetic, you know, I think we're, you know, it's very exciting to see that, that um, you know, improving all the time. 
Yeah, it's almost parallel to, to Moore's law, I mean, this ability to um, improve. Um, here's a, a question from the audience. Um, I'm pointing out that so far we've pretty much uh, highlighted specific engineering solutions almost at the gadget level. But um, maybe we could talk about systemic lessons um, that could improve a city as a whole. I mean, now sort of, you know, I know we're in the early stages and we just said that, but, I mean, are there... Just from your own observations, maybe um, speaking with clients that um, you could talk about on that sort of bigger level. Well, we've been working with um, some clients. You know, India is supposed to have 300 new cities or something like that in in in, in this um, century. So, you know, if you're starting from scratch and building a new city, uh, you're you know a little bit ahead of the game instead of trying to retrofit one. Um, but one way of approaching that is something that, that we call environmental performance standards. So if you have a natural environment, you look at how has a natural flora and fauna in that natural environment manage water, manage waste, manage energy, and then build your designs um, of that city uh, to, to meet those same metrics. And so it's, it's, it's very exciting, and, and it kind of enables nature not just to give you ideas, but actually to be um, a measure, you know, some, some metric that you can uh, test your designs, you know, to, to see if they meet that standard. And maybe we could um, apply this a little bit to, to New York City. I mean, is there a particular challenge that, um, that you think that a biomimetic approach could solve? Um, Chris, I'm wondering if, you know, with some of the clients that you work with, um, there's a certain issue that, that has come up or one that you think would be appropriate. Well, I think something that's, we can get to that systemic level if we look at uh, industrial ecosystems where, you know, if you think about in nature, as I think uh, someone mentioned earlier, there is no real waste. One organism uses what's left over from another for its own use, and it, it completely is cycling into a, in a, in a larger system that's um, self-regulating to a degree, well, to a great degree. Um, and industrial ecosystems is sort of mimicking that concept. Uh, so where a manufacturer of, uh, say, a power plant has, produces excess heat, which can be used for steam to power, to heat and cool homes in a neighborhood, then the uh, blast furnace slag can be used for gypsum wallboard. Um, the gypsum wallboard plant has waste that can be used at a pharmaceutical company. Um, to, and then its, its glycol waste can be used by other uh, manufacturers in that zone. So there really isn't, there's, waste isn't leaving the community. And if you think about an era of where we're looking to uh, address a lot of urban problems, whether it's wastewater treatment facilities, um, we have a combined sewer overflow issue in New York City. We're also, we have a, a food waste issue. We're talking about, you know, regional agriculture. We actually, if we, we can create a web of resources between industries and create new industries in New York, whether it's, I mean, the uh, Brooklyn Brewery actually does some of this, where they share some of their wastes are used to create energy. Um, and so we think about that, we actually create a resilient economy that's self-sufficient. Our dollars are flowing back into our own communities. Um, we're taking our waste and using that to create energy, create other products, and then the, the final product is a fertilizer that goes to make more food that then keeps us that cycle going. So we create a level of regional self-sufficiency, which you know, is, is powerful and from both an economic but also from all the other sort of environmental issues we're trying to tackle. It, could you maybe talk about um, how some of your products might be used in New York, um, even theoretically? Um, Solar Ivy is a product that goes on the facades of buildings and can skin any building here in New York. The software that we use to manage it uh, has the ability to find the solar exposure for that building in three dimensions, and then, again, go through that genetic al algorithm to best find the solution of how solar ivy can be populated on that building to provide either the most efficient system, um, and we utilize three different types of photovoltaics, uh, an organic that's completely recyclable and has the lowest carbon footprint, um, but that 
currently doesn't have the most efficiency. So when we're talking to the marketplace, we have to find the higher efficiency that a client might want. And so there's, again, this push and pull from the human world and the natural world. And yet, um, we're dealing with a public that still thinks of us as separate. Um, and so finding that relationship um, in a client and then uh, working with them to maximize the efficiency of their building through our systems is what we, what our, what our work is on the sales side. Um, the aspects of, of system integration, I think, is an important thing to address. Um, and at what scale? With our products, we're looking at multiple functionality in shading a building just as a plant would, um, maximizing its solar exposure, and then you know, preserving the wants of that homeowner. Um, you know, we create our product with recycled materials. It can, can be recycled and can be upgraded as technology advances and as the product comes to the end of its life cycle. So with this holistic look, view of how we can cr create a, a system of no waste, at what scale are we looking at it? And I think that that's an important question to ask all of ourselves. Does it happen at the city scale? Does it happen at the building scale? Does it happen at the manufacturing level? Um, we're addressing it at the manufacturing level and trying to have as much responsibility for our product in the marketplace. Um, but I think maybe we could talk about that. We have two trained architects here who, <laughs> um, who have a dialogue with looking at that system. And I think you know when you start to look at a much larger city and a manufacturing level, there's a lot of that happening. Uh, manufacturers are often looking at their waste and seeing the possibilities of where they could save a buck and, and, and find value in the waste that they create. Um, so maybe there are some, some other examples that we can talk about um, at the city level where you're looking at a huge, much larger organism than you would at a building level. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it depends on the material. You know, if we can, especially if we can create infrastructure for, you know, whether it's PET or whatever the recycled material is, to get it back to the best use. Uh, you know, New York City in particular is, you know, struggling with this challenge of, of waste and waste recycling. And it's coming up with, in, it's starting to get a couple of different options on the table, which is exciting. But, you know, I guess my interest is, is looking at making sure we, you know, we, we, there is a lot of science behind materials and material reuse and that we get we don't take just the most um the the standard answer like with it which is typically incineration mm -hmm. to to create energy um which has lots of can have some negative impacts around pollution versus looking at sort of this more closed loop idea of you know taking you know the manufacturer taking that product back disassembling it taking out the parts that it can upgrade and you know if it's if a product is designed like that it, it creates a much, you know, more efficient system for everybody. Mm -hmm. The manufacturer gets its product back as a new product, and you know, it can just dispose of only the things that are now obsolete, versus just taking the whole TV and just throwing it out onto the curb. Whereas 90% of the TV is still completely functional, completely valuable. It just needed, you know, hopefully in the future, just a software upgrade, mm -hmm. and then it has whatever it needs. Um, and we, you can see that's happening. I mean, technology is helping, helping that along. But, you know, recycling our organic waste is something that's really easy, and there's lots of really high-value options to recycle it. We just have to think about it and, and then in, in engage our communities on in finding realistic solutions. Um, it's happening. It's not like this is, this, this is some revolutionary concept. I mean, just look to, look to Europe and look to other countries that, are more concerned about their resources and resource restrictions, and you see brilliant solutions. And it seems to me that New Yorkers and others are very interested and willing to find ways to um, avoid discarding waste. Uh, I mean, even city dwellers who live in small studio apartments find ways to mm -hmm. uh, compost food or save food in their freezer and bring it to centers like the uh, green markets to be able to to recycle that, and I think there's really a hunger for more of, 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 of that sort of thing, not only on the personal level, but the business level. I mean, who wants to have to deal with waste and, and, and pay for it? Now, um, related to a question um, from the audience, um, can we talk about the process of discovery um, 
for new biomimetic products? I mean, um, and this question was directed dir directly to you, Mark. Um, you know, I mean, it, is it is it accidental? Is it? I mean, could you just talk a little bit about well, this? Well, there are kind of two sides. There's um, what we call biology to design and challenge to biology. So you may have um, biologists who uh, um, are doing their biology, and, and all of a sudden they say, hey, that would be a great idea for products, such as um, uh, Professor Kai Chang Lee in, in Oregon, who was walking along the Oregon coast. Um, he's a, a wood um, chemist. Um, and he noticed how, you know, the stacks that are along the coast in, in Oregon, when the tide is out, you have these, these mussels and other sorts of uh, barnacles attached really firmly to these wet, rough, dirty surfaces. And, you know, he's thinking, how does something stick to a wet, rough, dirty surface? Certainly none of the adhesives that we use will do that. Um, so to make a long story short, he was able to examine how the sea mussels uh, protein adhesive chemistry works and was able to come up with what's now called pure, bron pure bond of formaldehyde free wood ad adhesive. Then there's the other side where, you know, companies have challenges. They're using a toxic chemical or they're, or they have a process that's generating a lot of waste or there's a regulation that's going to eliminate one of their um, components. And so they're looking for a way to solve that. And um, they come to us, uh, um, or they, you know, go to academia or their own scientists, particularly if they've been trained in biomimicry, a lot of whom have through some of our uh, training sessions. Um, so there's sort of those, those, those two major approaches. And I'm wondering when, um, when you hear pitches, Pat, I mean, are there, are there some that fall short or the description of the discovery or the description of the the R and D and and then how that relates to some of the issues they're trying to solve. I mean, what what sort of falls flat? I mean, um, that would be very interesting um, to hear. You know, we've been hearing a lot of success stories, but I'm sure there are examples of of um, biomimetic designers coming to you um, and engineers. Uh, you know, and what doesn't work when when we do haven't not seen. I don't think I've it. seen anyone come to us with biomimetic designs that fall flat, but I'm quite sure there is the equivalent of greenwashing out there, where somebody is saying, this is designed on the principle of the flapping of the butterfly wings, and you look at it and it's just ridiculous. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of that out there. I sh I'm sure we will see more and more of that. Fortunately, we haven't yet. Um, the pitches that fall flat, fall flat for, you know, business and sort of personal reasons. It's, uh, Rena and I were talking about this a little earlier. It's the entrepreneur who comes in and does the 50 slide presentation with lots and lots and lots of documentation of the research they did in the lab where we really do need to know how this is gonna scale up. We really do need to know what your channels to market are. We really, this is a business. And we will help a, a researcher try to make this into a business. Um, in fact, there was one recently where the researcher had a fabulous technology. Uh, I can't say too much about it, but it was one that was going to go head to head with the construction industry. And he was dead set on creating a manufacturing plant. It was going to be co located with, you know, off gassing of CO2 by the dirty power plants. That was going to be hard to do. The building of these facilities was going to be hard to do. And then it was going to go head to head up against the big concrete manufacturers and try to get his product to market, which, by the way, was going to cost more. So there were lots of reasons why this wasn't going to work, but it was a great idea. So we encouraged him to look at perhaps going in the direction of licensing where those big, huge corporations that are already making cement or concrete cement um, would license his idea and take it to market for him because then we really would get deployment of this fabulous technology. And if he kept beating himself against the wall and beating up investors with slides and slides and slides with chemical reaction stuff on it, it wasn't going to get anywhere that way. Was this someone who had... <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Does he sound familiar? Um, Come on. No, but my, my, my question um, is more generic. Thank uh, you. Is it someone who had already tried pilot scale 
testing at all, or was this just idea at the laboratory bench scale? There, there, had, there had been a tiny pilot production. But it was going to eat lots and lots and lots of money. You'd know who it is. Come on, stop. <laughs> stop. You're, you want to watch me squirm hanging out? Because there are a lot of people who are trying to solve that same challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are, these are important issues. Certainly, the, I mean, you two are especially very familiar with the problem of cement production. It, uh, I don't know how much of the audience is familiar with this issue, but not only do you generate massive amounts of CO2 when you take cement from the limestone stage to the powder stage. You bake it, you cook it, you crush it, you do all kinds of things to it, and that uses enormous amounts of energy. But then when it is setting up as concrete, it also off-gasses CO2. So I think uh, cement is responsible for something like 2% of the world. What is it? 11. Oh, come on. Global. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Okay, so it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got to solve no, it. It was an 09 figure. It right, might be okay. a little different now, but back to my okay. it was 11% of global. So it's a problem production. we've got to solve. So we were, we were very happy to sort of uh, help the entrepreneur to come to a solution that was probably the best way to get it deployed because it is a real problem. It, it just meant not us. As It was what you were asking before. It means we're not going to invest but it means the product is going to get out there and have an effect, and that's what I really care about. So um, going back to sort of the macro level, a, a question from the audience is um, what kind of environment, business, academic, political, needs to exist for biomimetic design to become more normal? Um, and, you know, this was an issue uh, that came up. I remember going to a panel at the, the Clinton Global Initiative um, where – um, Janine Benyus was saying, invite a biologist to every design meeting, to every engineering meeting, to NGO meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that was, that's one way to make um, biomimetic design more normal. Um, she didn't use that term, I'm using this one. But um, maybe you could address that going back to sort of the, the macro level, but with a, with, a, with a step like that. I mean, is it as simple as inviting um, a biologist to the table? In our design practice, I believe that having as many people at the table that could be a stakeholder in the project is important in, in finding an, an effective solution. Uh, so having a biologist at the table would make sense if you're, if you're trying to have this be the new normal. So I would add that it's a little bit analogous to the integrated design process in architecture, which is maybe it shouldn't just be a biologist. It should be a chemist, a physicist, yeah. uh, a material scientist, an engineer, and that's the way it's done at the Wies Institute. It's a very cross-disciplinary exploration of what does science and nature teach us in order for us to learn those devices and mimic them, and it's not just biology. It, the word is biomimicry, but it's sort of all of the sciences. I mean, that nature is not just biology. That, I, I would just add that it, the reality also is that innovation is just hard, and whether it's biomimetic or any other kind. And, and so we, I don't think it's different from just innovation, uh, mm -hmm. and we want to keep trying to make it this separate thing, and I think to make it more normal is to see it as part of a large toolkit of innovative opportunities. And you know, the more you look at biomimicry, the, more, the easier it is to understand why the, the, sort of princ the primary principles make a lot of sense. Um, and, and so it, it can sort of, it takes on a life of its own. But I don't, I don't think it needs to, I mean, I think trying to isolate it on its, into its own little world is half the problem. Like, yeah. Get it out. Like, let people play with it. Like, don't make it sound like it's something that's foreign and scary and weird. And oh, you know, I failed biology in high school, so I ugh, don't want to talk about it. You know, and, ugh. You know it's like, no, it's let's go take a walk in the woods. Let's talk about, mm -hmm. you know, what's going on. And I think it's, you know, people get excited once you help them understand. I think that's why you need a biology to buy, the design deals because a lot of people just they don't get it, so they're scared, and so they don't want to talk about it because they don't want to look stupid. But all you got to do is. We are naturally attuned to nature. It's, we're part of it. Remember, we're not separate. <laughs> biology is, we're all right, biology is right here in this room. Like, so we've got to remember that. And I, I think in both academia and government, there's, there's also a role. So certainly looking forward in the long term, if you have 
uh, disciplines, instead of being in their silo, you have chemistry and you have biology and you have architecture, you have them more integrated so they understand coming out of school that there's a role, that they're all integrated just like nature, it's multidisciplinary, that that would, I think, go a long way. Um, and also government, if, if, if we can begin to have um, incentives, whether they be tax incentives or some types of policy tools that help drive companies to, to look at biomimicry, um, that might also be effective. Well, actually, on that point, the National Science Foundation has a nature-inspired grant program that's, that's an opportunity right now for funding. So it is happening. It's like it's the, just, just the beginning point of where we're getting funding, like NYSERDA's funding for our program or the National Science Foundation. But those are, those are, these are big organizations that are really focused on making change. So I think it, we're at a point where we're releasing some sort of uh, real build up on this idea and the real realization that there's an opportunity that needs to be um, attacked. You know, like nothing just happens overnight, even though we, when we see it for the first time, we think it happened overnight, it didn't, so. It, it seems like there's another channel too that we can um, go through sort of a, a, a soft channel, um, and this relates to um, another question from the audience, which is, um, what is the role of the arts and culture in nurturing better systems? Um, and I thought that also could be a question we could direct you, towards you, Sam, you know, given that, I don't know, if, I, I know some people are, are familiar with Solar Ivy, you, you heard his description, but um, it's in the permanent collection of MoMA. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful product aesthetically, um, but also in the way that it functions and technically. So maybe we could start there. I mean, what, what are the, what's the role of art and culture in getting this um, idea out? I think the role of art and culture can be a huge tool in spreading this idea in a passionate way. When people see a piece of work that they absolutely love, they can't stop talking about it. Um, and they share it with everyone, and that's been our experience, at least with our piece being in the MoMA. Um, people had this visceral reaction, and when we address aesthetics and functionality in our products, we try and create this transformative experience of how the product can be perceived in its location, um, but also that it's fully functional in that location and it's there for a purpose. Um, and I, I believe that those things can be huge tools in, in spreading this idea. I think another role um, would be in showing the beauty of nature's functionality. So, you know, you have something like a butterfly wing. Um, so, you know, we all enjoy just looking at a beautiful iridescent butterfly wing, but if uh, we also know that that color is produced not from pigment, but from the microscale structure of the wing, I think that would really be of, of, of interest to people. Or, you know, the, all the various spiral shapes that we see in nature, they're not just beautiful to look at, they're, they're the most efficient way of, of moving fluids. So there's many, many ways that we can um, sort of teach the functionality of nature through its beauty. Does anyone want to add to that? I know we're coming up on um, the Q&A period from the online audience, correct? Um, oh, in, two, in a couple more minutes? Okay, okay. Um, should we take another audience question here? Um, okay. I might add one thing. We were talking about New York City. Yes. Um, one approach that, that we're trying to take, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with the Manhattan Project, Mm -hmm. that looked at information that was available on the original flora and fauna that was in Manhattan and actually was able to, um, you know, take Manhattan Island and actually, you know, show what sort of plants and animals and insects were in each kind of square acre. Um, and so as I mentioned about the work that we're doing in India with new cities looking at the, the flora and fauna that are there now, um, the idea is to sort of take this information and once you know what kinds of plants and animals were there, you can study how those plants and animals um, dealt with the water and the waste and the energy and, and um, all of that and begin to perhaps come up with some uh, ideas that are appropriate to the context uh, of New York City. 
And we actually used this approach on a, a design project to identify the fact there was a river underneath a building that we were working on, a, a large existing building in the city. And we've actually convinced the, we, we convinced the client to measure the amount of water that was being pumped into the sewer system because of the deep basements. And it was uh, tens of millions of gallons of water per year. And we're actually about to start construction on the first phase to harvest that water so it's not going into the sewer system and infecting our, affecting our uh, combined sewer flow overflow issue, but actually to use to cool the cooling towers for the air conditioning systems for the building. So they're getting free water. We're reducing the demand on the fresh water supply of, of, for the city and we're reducing the negative impacts on the sewer system. So really working with nature and with what's on our site and not just demanding what we need to make the building work and function its, in its own way. So I think that's, that's just one very tangible way of thinking about um, this idea of like what was on a site originally and how do we work with nature. Um, and actually doing this creates a, a, a more analogous uh, uh, de uh, evaporation rate that's actually closer to the original evaporation rate of the forest that was on that site. So thinking about that, I, this idea of environmental uh, performance standards, ecological performance standards that we're using to, to think about buildings in a more uh, holistic manner. And then one also interesting effect that I was thinking about also with um, another one of your products is that um, biomimicry, you know, it inspires other biomimetic products, but also other innovations that might not necessarily reflect nature. But it's just, a, it's a very interesting starting point um, to that innovation cycle. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, how um, Solar Ivy went into the next yeah, product? Yeah, actually, um, the, the concept that started Solar Ivy was a concept called Grow, uh, which is a hybrid wind and solar device. Um, and in that, we were capturing the wind that could hit the surface of a building. Um, and we're doing that through a small generator device um, that we then patented. And from the knowledge that we were able to gain in creating this hybrid device, we were able to develop Solar Ivy such that it had much more versatility in how it could be applied to a surface of a building. Um, and then our work with Solar Ivy and that modularity led to another product called Tensile Solar, um, which follows rules of tensile architecture, uh, similar to soap film um, or spider webs. And utilizes a modular system of photovoltaic panels that's also driven by our proprietary software that has a genetic algorithm embedded in it. So from that very early idea, we've gone through this journey of developing new products that have different marketplaces that they can be applied, um, unique manufacturing processes that are standardized yet allow for us to have a high level of customization. Um, so these early ideas can really tear off into a lot of different genealogies of products, um, just as our, our, our evolution has, has done as well. Nicely put. Um, and I think we have a, a few questions from online that are we do. coming Hello. up from Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah <laughs> from Solar One. Uh, first of all, just to, oh. Thank you. Uh, first of all, just to give you guys an idea of how the Twitter feed is going, a lot of people got really excited when you were talking about the Brooklyn Brewery and the fact that they are <laughs> converting their waste into energy, which I have to say, I've never seen so much excitement over waste. So <laughs> good job, Chris Garvin. Maybe we can get a tour. Ooh, it's easy. Brooklyn yeah. Brewery, maybe we can get a tour. Yeah? Um, <laughs> I actually am going to take a question from Green Tech Media and kind of spin it a little. Uh, they said, Solar Ivy Public still thinks that the human and the natural world are separate. Do you agree or disagree? I'd like to ask that question to all of you and maybe also ask, you know, what kind of methodology or thinking or like, you know, uh, work can we do as a community of investors and academics and, and entrepreneurs and thinkers to kind of change that, to have people not think so anthropogenically, but also to think that we are part of the natural world in and of itself. So I throw it out to the audience, or to the speakers, yeah. Well... I, well, I would I would say that we're one. There's no yeah, there's no distinction. I, like it's a it's a mental construct that doesn't actually exist. It's sort of like time. I <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I agree that I believe that we are one. I don't know if that's what they were saying. 
uh, on my statement. They wanted to, they threw it out to the online audience okay. whether they agreed or disagreed with your uh, statement. And so that's my question if you guys agree or disagree. Well, clearly yeah. we're all <laughs> part. I mean, not just because it's obvious, but because, I mean, look at the um, contamination that has occurred, you know, in the world over the, uh, over the course of the Industrial Revolution. Um, if you look at any of the annual CDC studies of exposure to chemicals, I think they look at a hundred or several hundred, and how many of those are in our bloodstream and in our fatty tissue. So, um, and then of course there's the whole global warming issue. So clearly we're not separate from, from nature and what we put into nature. It's all cyclic. And I'd also say we're not above nature. You know, there's this sort of a, um, a Western concept that man is somehow here to sort of manage the planet and it's our sort of dominion to control and sort of fits well with the industrial revolution and, and many other sort of major drives in the world. But we're now seeing the sort of what happens when we do that without thinking more holistically and really thinking what happens in nature. And we're, we're evolving with, with our mistakes and with our successes. Um, so just as there's all these toxins in our, in our bodies that we've actually put out into the world, our bodies are also adapting to them and our genetics are changing because of them, for better, for worse. I'm wondering if there, are any, if there were any lessons that you took from the, that project in India that you were talking about that can be applied you know, here in New York. I know it might be very difficult because they're two very different situations, but that sort of represents a, a challenge that everybody faces with the issues that we're discussing. You know, I mean, here you had the opportunity to start from scratch. Here we don't. You know, um, there are tremendous infrastructure challenges, policy challenges, et cetera. I mean, how do you, how do you bring both of those two um, bits of research together? Can you? Um, it'd be wonderful to sort of undo what we've what we've done, but we can't. So maybe well, there's a way is, of applying it. One way, as I mentioned it. before, using the data that's there from the Manhattan Project about um, what the what the indigenous flora and fauna did, how they managed water, the evaporation rates, and that sort of thing. Um, but you know, we have a lot of opportunity here. I mean, just think of all the surfaces that we have on all the buildings. Um, and how we could utilize those surfaces, whether they, they be the, the um, horizontal surfaces of roofs or the vertical surfaces for things like, like the SMIT technology. Um, One of the things that we actually worked with uh, HOK on a proposal where we were using solar ivy to mimic the canopy and, uh, of a, an area, and it actually was a product project in India. I don't know if you were working on this one. Um, and we were doing that so that we could recreate the light and humidity factors of that area and still provide electricity for the buildings that were right there, um, but also close the gap between the wild environment and the human-built environment um, and, and have them overlap as much as possible so that you'd have that come right up to your door. Um, and that's one of the things that we were excited to see as an additional functionality um, that we could provide. Um, so there, there are ways, I think, in closing that gap. And there are a number of solutions that are becoming available as green walls, green roofs, and things like that. Pat or Chris, do you want to add to that in terms of um, ways of closing the gap? I don't have any comments. <laughs> I've, I've, I am very anxious to see that project in India. Is it going to get built? <laughs> That one, um, we ended up not meeting the, the needs electrically. But right. I believe it's still being built, though. We'll see. <laughs> Good. So another audience question um, sort of ties back to um, Miriam's introduction um, in terms of uh, patent protection and biomimetic innovation. Um, have any of the panelists encountered any particular problems in securing patent protection at all? with any of these projects? Not for encountered? us. We have a number of different patents, um, but no issues in securing them. Uh, a patent is only as good as it makes money, so you can have these great ideas, and if you don't have the business to support it, um, then it's moot, so. It's true, end of story. But. Yeah, and, and the companies that come to us for consulting, uh, it's pretty straightforward how we 
you know, uh, develop the, the IP. It hasn't been a problem. And the, the one company that we looked at that uh, really had, actually Miriam mentioned it, this uh, Regen Energy is a company that I've spent a lot of time with. They have filed patents as though bees weren't even part of it, really. You know, it, it talks about the, the system works um, according to swarm logic. The regen system is a system of controllers that sit on top of, re attached to rooftop air conditioners, RTUs, which are sitting on top of a big box store. So a big box store might have 10 of these sitting on the roof. They measure the temperature of the space in the store below. A normal RTU will measure this, the temperature and control the load based on that temperature. Um, I'm getting off the point of patents, but I do want to explain this because it's really quite no, it's fascinating, fascinating and it's a biomimetic device. Uh, the controllers that Regen supplies have all of the rooftop units talking to each other using the swarm logic of bees, which they were able to patent. Um, and that means that during the peak hours of the day when it's really, really hot and all the air conditioners want to go up because the thermostats downstairs are telling them to do so, if they were to do that, they would hit a very high KW load. And your utility bill for the year will be based on the fact that you hit that 600 kilowatt draw that day. So if these units are all talking to each other and two over here are saying, well, if he's on and he's on and he's on, I'm going to be off and I'm going to be off and I'm going to be off, and they vary their duty cycle because they're talking to each other. And that's the swarm logic aspect which they were able to patent. Um, if they do that, they can bring that KW load at any given moment down maybe from 600 KW to 400 KW, yet the store downstairs is getting the same temperature. So this is a very good example of a mimetic device being used in a company that then has to go forward into the real world and patent it like with real patent lawyers and, you know, it, it's not nature anymore. You have to go through all the same processes and the patent office is not it's natural at all. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to do. And then, of course, you have all the externalities. Even though the company is wonderful, the management is great, the technology is great, who are the decision makers? Is it some guy in Texas who's making decisions about a store that he has in Massachusetts, New York, Long Island, and they have different utility regimes who are doing something different with peak load pricing systems. So these market forces, these other externalities, really affect the success of these devices. So it's, it's just an interesting example of how these things work. You can get the patent thing done. You can get the technology down. You can have a great team. And there's still other things you have to work with. That are very unnatural. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the process. So, Sarah, another question from the um, online world. Yeah. So, this is another one from uh, Kotija1. I apologize if I didn't pronounce that properly. She's actually uh, watching from Urbana, Illinois. So, we've got people watching from all over the country. The question is biomimicry projects are the most successful if companies are involved with the formulation of final needs and the money from the get go. Um, but, how does that? Uh, she says jive um, with intellectual property issues in academia. So you have these academics who are going out and they're finding this information and then um, businesses are capitalizing it and marketing it and turning it into a product. How does that relationship work? Are there any conflicts or issues related to it? Yeah. I can speak to that sure. a little. Um, some universities have, each university typically has their own IP policy. And in some universities there are strong tech transfer organizations that will bring a technology that's developed by a researcher or a professor out into the public domain. Um, and each one's very unique. So I would suggest that if they're in a university to research that IP policy, if they're a student or if they're a professor, and understand what that road looks like um, before they get there and so that they can position themselves well. And companies come to biomimicry in different ways, too. Not The, the IP isn't necessarily necessarily at an academic institution. It, it may be, but they may actually develop that IP in-house working with uh, Biomimicry 3.8 or, or other uh, biologists. So then it's a homegrown IP that they own easily. So there's, there's multiple avenues. Or it can be licensed um, from an independent entrepreneur who's come, or scientist who's come up with an idea that's in his patent. So there's many ways to come to, to, to get the Biomimic uh, product. Any more from Twitter right now? Okay. Um, actually, I have a question for 
uh, from Mark, which is uh, biomimicry 3.8 is represents sort of an evolution for the organization that you were working with before. Can you talk about that? I mean, that that sort of symbolizes um, the Mi Biomimicry Institute and other organizations have come together now under sort of a newer umbrella, which I think um, represents um, a change in the way that biomimicry might be practiced or understood or scaled up. So it might be kind of interesting to, to talk about that. I mean, this is pretty new news, isn't it? Um, yeah. So um, 3.8, as you probably figured out, uh, symbolizes 3.8 billion years of, of life on Earth. Um, and just as life is multidisciplinary, biomimicry 3.8 is multidisciplinary. So under one roof, we have our um, nonprofit uh, educational type of work, which you know ranges from online courses to um, a whole master's level course. Um, we have our uh, consulting work. Um, we have the asnature.org, um, which is uh, really a great uh, concept that if, if I may say so, um, not that I came up with it, but as part of Biomimicry 3.8, which, which is a freely accessible website that, that provides biological information by function. So most biological information that you have access to is by, you know, kingdom, class, phylum, all, all that sort of thing. Um, but this is, is biology organized by, by function so that if you're trying to solve a challenge, you're trying to make a better adhesive, a non-toxic color, a waterproof um, container, whatever, you know, that's the function. You can go to this database and see how does nature, how has nature solved that, that same function. Um, so all of these now are, are under this, this umbrella. And, and, you know, just as, as, as nature gets its information out through networks, um, our idea for biomimicry 3.0 of, of getting this concept of biomimicry out into the world is by creating networks. So through um, even something like an opportunity to, to speak on a panel um, or to have our, our week-long uh, workshops for designers or to have these, these master's level programs is creating a network to sort of just get it out into the world. So, have any of you worked with them yet? I'm just curious. So. We're working with them on some of their educational projects, and uh, we've worked with that project in HOK was, uh, I think, a product project where the Biomimicry Guild was involved a little bit. Um, so we're we're involved, and we have the Nice Herda program, which is a joint effort here in New York. And we've uh, talked to Janine Benius when it was the Biomimicry Guild about various technologies. From time to time, she would call us and see if we could work on funding of something, and we would look at it. And it sounds like it's it's um, sort of moving out of its its closed world. I mean, that seems to be the goal um, that we're all moving forward yes. to. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions from the audience before we wrap up. No, no, okay. Great. Um, I wanted to wanted to just thank everybody for this discussion um, and all of the amazing examples um, that we've gone through tonight. Um, I hope that everybody stays for drinks and networking. And um, would also love to thank our sponsors: Nyserta, Con Edison, Loeb and Loeb, Green Tech Media, which is a partner, um, Young Professionals in Energy, the New York Asso Association for Energy Economics, and of course our event partner, Terrapin Bright Green. So thank you, and please stay for drinks. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>